Welcome to The Long Road. I'm your host, Chris Roberts. And <clears throat> New Hampshire is quite a buzz. Today is Monday. When you see this show on um, Wednesday night, there'll be a, a sucking vacuum in New Hampshire as the primary will be all over and the presidential candidates will be rushing out of the state of New Hampshire to spend the next 10 or 11 days down in South Carolina. I think their primary is on Saturday, June 21st. Um, <clears throat> as many of us probably seen, this um, presidential um, primary season has been um, quite different. There hasn't been very many candidates running around. Um, <clears throat> they spent quite a bit of time in, in Iowa. I think they've done like 12 debates. And so they're not, plesh, as they say, pressing the flesh and it doesn't seem like they're spending the kind of money that they used to do in the past. So <clears throat> I really have to wonder, has this changed the um, New Hampshire's position as first in the nation um, primary going forward? Um, <clears throat> coming out of Iowa, just a short window. And if while we're proud of the tradition of the New Hampshire primary, as you look at Iowa and you look at South Carolina, one of the um, selfish reasons of the primaries that the states want, that's why they're all fighting to move up, is making money. The money that these presidential campaigns um, bring into the state. And so I haven't seen any flyers. I haven't had anybody knocking on my door. And so I think we just really have to question, maybe we had our primary way too soon. Maybe we needed a gap in between um, Iowa. <clears throat> South, like I said, South Carolina, I think, is taking um, 11 days. So don't know what the primary results will be, but they'll be quite interesting. So <clears throat> next I'm going to move on to um, <clears throat> a touchy subject, a subject that has really riled a lot of the citizens, citizens of, of Keene and surrounding towns. Um, there's still letters to the editor concerning it, and <clears throat> numerous letters to the editor have um, stated my, my name, and I was quoted in the paper about it. And if you haven't guessed right now, it's the new Bobcat. <clears throat> the Bobcat, it's a small, it's, I think it's a um, disingenuous name because we all know that the bobcat is quite a small animal. <clears throat> and so I have a picture of the bobcat. It's a pretty big vehicle. It's an intimidating vehicle. And, and I, as I read more and more of the um, letters to the editor, um, a lot of people in the area seem to believe that it, it gives them um, an intimidating view intimidating view, and it doesn't really um, belong in Keene. Um, it's going to cost $285,000. We're not going to get the, um, we're not paying for the 200, to purchase a vehicle, the 285000 It's a grant that's being provided by Homeland Security. And, <clears throat> and it's one of those things, like I stated, um, as I was quoted, if we had to buy it, I would um, never, never have supported it. Um, I asked some questions in the FOP committee. I, um, <clears throat> I just had some concerns about it. I didn't feel really good about it. Um, I was told that the surrounding communities, about 21 communities, would help um, <clears throat> fund the cost. Um, <clears throat> what I was recently told that um, the police departments would pony up $100 each or about $2,100 to help pay the cost of the um, insurance. But I was also told when I went up to um, Concord last week that a number of the um, <clears throat> state representatives who also serve as selectmen or know people in the surrounding towns are kind of a little upset because in some cases the chiefs of police never told the towns that um, they were going to spend money on the Bobcat. They, I had asked the question, <clears throat> what happens if it gets damaged? I was told that while there's no cost to support another community, but if it gets damaged while 
helping another community to <clears throat> in an emergency or some line of police work that other community would um, come up with um, <clears throat> would help in the cost of repairs. Again, I don't know if the surrounding towns um, understand that agreement. <laughs> the um, <clears throat> my um, first, view, but the first thing that came to my mind when I saw this picture was um, <clears throat> the unfortunate part was it looked like either a South African apartheid vehicle. It kind of reminded me of <clears throat> the vehicles in the 70s that South Africa was using against um, the non-white people as they were <clears throat> oppressing them. The other time a vehicle like this, it's definitely a militaristic vehicle. It's the type of vehicle that you would do in the, um, <clears throat> the roads of Afghanistan or in some other mountainous um, reasons. Region. It's almost really <clears throat> a souped up um, Hummer. There's a question. <clears throat> Hopefully, um, how are we going to use it? Hopefully, it'll, it'll never be used. But the problem is, sometimes when you have a big toy, you got to find ways to, to use that toy. <clears throat> I just hope the, um, the police department never use it in parades, because I don't, it may, excite the little kids, but I don't think so. My 10-year-old um, grandson, this, just this morning when he saw the picture, <clears throat> he said, Papa, why do we need this? And um, <clears throat> I could not give him an answer. But the question going forward, we have the vehicle. Um, <clears throat> we have um, no idea how much it's going to cost to maintain the vehicle. We have no idea what it's going to cost to operate the vehicle. Um, I think Manchester has two. Some of them on the sea coast have some. And Nashville may have one. And um, the unfortunate part, um, <clears throat> we weren't given the cost of um, <clears throat> the operation of these vehicles by those um, communities. Kind of were told it was unavailable. So maybe next time when we get ready to accept a grant or accept something from Homeland Security, we would be able to get the information concerning the operation costs and <clears throat> whatever, because this vehicle in the budget going forward, we're going to have to create a, a line item, you know, or we're going to have to add to the vehicle maintenance line item in the police department to cover the costs. And I think as a number of um, <clears throat> people and uh, citizens have said, you know what, we have higher priorities. But we have it. We got to, um, hopefully, like I said, we just park it behind the police station and um, never have to use it. So <clears throat> we're going to move on. But well, before we move on, and just to um, tell people, when I had served in the Marine Corps and I was in Saudi Arabia, I had a really bad head injury. And as a result of that head injury, in the TBI, I had suffered um, a stroke, and part of that stroke, one of the damage was the left side of my vocal cords. And so if it comes across, if I'm clearing my throat or I go into these moments of coughing, it's just that the something hits the um, left side of the vocal cords at the wrong time, and sometimes my <clears throat> airway tends to, to, to close up. So I hope it's not too irritating. Um, another one, it was, I was going through, and it was the AP, and it was talking about GOP candidates weighed into the, feuds, the food stamp debate. And right off the bat, because of the recession, because the people have lost jobs, because the elderly haven't, um, except for this year, went two years without um, a cost of living increase in, the, in their Social Security because there's been little return on investments, if you still have investments, now that more than 45 million people received benefits, received benefits last year. And it costs $75 billion to the government, a record number as the um, economy has failed, <clears throat> has faulted. And so when you go into that, if, and again, averages are, are rough, that would come out to about $240 per month per person, or about $60 a week. And for 240 bucks a month, 
as you can see, a lot of people, um, you can't, if you're spending $240 a month for, for two people, you may have um, <clears throat> a very spartan diet. Um, you may be going to the, um, one of the <clears throat> day old um, bread outlets. You're finding ways to pinch pennies because 60, living on $60 a week isn't very much. And so as we go on food stamps, you could be a married couple and um, have two kids. And if you're living in Keene, making $10 an hour, and you're paying eight, $900 for rent, you're paying maybe $100 plus for electricity, then you're paying for fuel if it's not counted, all of a sudden your money is not there. And so you, you have to use food stamps, helps keep your, your, your family fed. And so a lot of times you get the stereotype of um, the people that are on food stamps. And Newt Gingrich, <clears throat> both Gingrich and Santorum, I'm talking about them because, like I said, when you're listening, watching this show, the primary be over. It's criticism, criticism last week when they spoke of all overhauling food stamps and other welfare programs by seeming to equate food stamp recipients and blacks. Gingrich said he would encourage blacks to demand paychecks, not food stamps. And Sansarum said he did not want to make black people live better. He did not want to make pa black people's lives better by giving them someone else's money. I want to give them the opportunity to go out and earn money. <clears throat> As a biracial pe person, I consider both of those comments extremely insulting. And according to the 2010 census, about 26% of food stamp recipients, in, recipients, recipients are black, while 49% are white and 20% are Hispanic. So basically one out of every two people on food stamps <clears throat> are white. Sansorum and Newt Gingrich said nothing about um, helping finding jobs for um, white people who are on food stamps. And so I can guarantee you, if you go down to the food kitchen, there's a lot of white people down there who don't want to be in the food kitchen. They don't want to bring their children down to the food kitchen. They don't want to count on the food kitchen. They want jobs. They want a job so they can bring enough money home to feed their families. And so for politicians to find it, say, yeah, it's insulting. You know, <clears throat> these people are just, as you say, sucking on the, um, the nipple of the United States, using other people's hard-earned taxpayer money. I think in the majority of the cases, they're extremely wrong. And I'm saying they're inconsiderate and they're devaluing their fellow American citizens. Are there Hispanics? Are there blacks? Are there white people taking advantage of the food stamp system? Yes. Are there, you can go to California when they talk about people using their food stamp money and going to Las Vegas and gambling. People using their food stamp money and taking cruises. People going places. <clears throat> okay. Yes, that's happening. And so what you should be doing, what the government should be doing, is tracking down the people that have filed false claims, who abuse the food stamp system, and take the food stamps away from them. Plain and simple. Do not go in and disgrudge a hard, the people who want a job or the working poor, because we know there are people working at full time at Walmart, at McDonald's, at Wendy's, and a number of other places, and they're working, they have full time jobs, or they have a job that is just below what you need to qualify for health care to cover your family. And so, yes, they're on food stamps, okay? But they're working. It is not their fault. There's not high paying jobs in the Keene area for, to give them a living wage or get them a little bit more than over the poverty line. <clears throat> and for the sake, when I grew up, I remember the, the farm FDA surplus food. I remember going down once a month and getting the, the cheese, getting the butter. And I have to tell you, 
the cheese and the butter that was high quality, it, it was good. Yes, you had pork in the can, you had beef in the can, okay? <clears throat> it was, it created a healthy diet. Yes, when I grew up in, in the project when they were giving out food stamps to people, yes, people were trading food stamps, 50 cents and a dollar for cigarettes or for booze, okay? But again, not everyone was doing it. That was a small percentage. And what we need to do is track down those people, punish them, and if necessary, put them in prison. Then when they get out, make them pay the money back. But on the other side of the, um, <clears throat> the food stamp issue, what about the corporate food stamp people? <clears throat> in 2008, <clears throat> The, the federal government passed the Food Conservation and Energy Act of 2008. And so that six-year bill is going to cost us, the taxpayers, $288 billion. Okay. But in a lot of cases, it's corporate welfare. And so in the year 2010, the United States paid farmers either to grow, assist in growing, or not to grow, $6 billion. And when you go, the top 10% of farmers or agribusinesses accounted for 63% of that money or almost $4 billion. The top 2% received 50% of all payments or over $3 billion. The top 1%, again, they there was 10,143 farmers and agribusiness. They accounted, top 1% accounted for 21% of $1.3 billion for an average of $126,000 each. The next 1% accounted for 29% of the $6 billion. There was 20,287 individual farmers and businesses, which got $1.8 billion, and they got $89,000. The bottom 20%, or 801, 800, basically 812,000 farmers, and in some cases, <clears throat> Michelle Bachman, for example, got some, and a lot of politicians received um, subsidies. But there's 8, 812,000 farmers got 1.2. They got an average of $1,494. And so maybe when we our politicians are complaining about the waste in um, food stamps. Maybe they should look how basically 2% of all the farmers and agribusinesses, less, basically 30,000 um, companies, 30,000 compared to 45 million. 45 million, if you averaged it out, like I said, that would come out to about $2,700 per family. The top 2%, 30,000. 3.1 billion, and that comes out on an average about $110,000 each. Quite a difference between $110,000 and 2700 But when we go deeper into it, GPA Management Group from Dateland, Arizona. It's a private company with a staff, basically one to, one to four employees, no one seems to be able to know what they do, what they sell, but in 2010, they received $1.8 million. Nope, nope, my, my mistake. <clears throat> 8.9, no, $1.8 million in 2010. And since 19, between the time of 1995 or 200, 2010, in 15 years, they received $8.9 million. And basically, $8 million of that was to, for growing cotton or not growing cotton in Arizona. <clears throat> if you study your history, you will realize that cotton is a really tough crop on the soil. And that was one of the reasons why um, southern states wanted to move out west, Texas and other places to find new soil to replace the depleted soil in the south. Cotton takes a lot of water. Cotton, like I said, pays, costs a lot to grow. 
So why in the United States are we paying over the past 15 years $8 million to possibly grow cotton in Arizona? Pretty arid. Also, when we went, there was a number of um, companies that were getting food subsidies from the government to grow rice in California. Again, much cheaper to import rice from overseas. We're talking about a free market economy, but our politicians who say free market, free market, have no problem whatsoever spending $288 billion to throw the, um, the free market. And so that was one of the in-depth looks into it. And so what we're going to do right now is I'm going to take a break, show you about a three and a half minute um, clip. And then what we're going to do is we're going to bring in to talk about a little um, trick, how we playing with the numbers by government. And then we'll talk about Mr. Obama's new campaign. And so I hope you enjoy the clip and I'll be right back. Welcome back, and um, <clears throat> one of the things, I hope you can guess as many of the um, different sites for, um, this was gold for Mr. Lindsay, who um, used to be in the Coast Guard, a state rep, and is um, 
looking at a number of these things and he's really about the Great Lakes. The little um, rock memorial that you saw on the beach, those were for um, three individuals that, um, that died in the um, sinking of the um, Everett Fitzgerald. That's at White Point, uh, Michigan. <clears throat> so now we're going to go into the, the tricky numbers of the week. During the um, last month, Congress and the President were arguing over the payroll tax cut, 2%. The numerous over and over again, the president secretary said that um, there was 160 million American workers that were, could we, um, lose $1,000 a month. That's what they were getting. And so w it was going to be de dangerous to the economy. We had to pass it. We had to pass it. And so the, a lot of the American workers were um, getting excited about um, the continued passage. They didn't want to lose. Uh, a thousand dollars, and um, so they were going. They got caught up, but then as we go through the numbers, well, if you go and look at the census and you you look at the um, United States Bureau of Labor Statistics, in 2010, well, it's 2011, there was 131 million workers in the United States. So. Where did the other 30 million people come from, the other 30 w million workers? Okay, so again, all of a sudden, politics, you're going fighting and fighting, and we created 60 million workers in, in the United States. If anything, the unemployment is going down, unemployment rate is going down because more and more Americans are um, falling out of the, um, the workforce. A, a lot of um, people who at 62 are retiring because they can't get a job, so they fall out of the workforce. Of course, it's going to cause some serious problems later on because they, they're going to get a reduced Social Security check. But also, when you go to Bureau of Labor Statistics, I'm rounding it off <coughs> to make it easier, <coughs> the average American worker makes $20 an hour. Of course, it's not in Keene, you know, it makes up because if you're living in New York or you're living in high San Francisco or um, Silicon Valley or you're working in Los Angeles, Orange County, $20 seems, $20, $25 may seem like a lot, but again, it's not going to be a livable wage. But then again, the average American worker only works 34 hours a week. Again, we would also make the assumption, well, 20 times 40 but, like I said, the average worker only works 34 hours per week. A number of workers only work, they work under 32, so the companies don't um, have to pay, them, pay their health care or other benefits. Other companies say, well, I won't pay your benefits, but I'll give you a higher salary. So that's the catch up. So at 20 times 34, that's $680 a week. So we're talking about $13.60 $13 for the average um, worker. <clears throat> so basically, the government said you were going to get, the politicians said you were going to get $20 a week savings. So basically, about $6.40 less. But the problem is the Social Security, 2% Social Security tax, which was supposed to go into. Um, into the Social Security Trust Fund has to be made up by law. So what we are doing, if this continued over the course of the 12 months, if they continue it after the two-month extension, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to come up to 80 to 100 and maybe up to possibly $160 million, billion dollars to cover the lost revenue to go into, the, into Social Security. So again, that's a debt. We're creating a deficit this year and adding on to the overall debt. So again, they didn't bring it to the American people. So here's the question. Uh, the American people want $13 a week more at the cost of $100 plus billion dollars on the national debt. <clears throat> and so the more and more you go on the debt, the more the United States has to borrow and the more it has to borrow, the cheaper the U.S. dollar, the value of the U.S. dollar drops. 
And so, again, at this particular time, because of the things that's going on in Europe, that's a little tricky. But maybe it's just coincidence, but it happened last Since we approved the, uh, the last week in December, I think December 21st, they said nationally that's the lowest, um, that was the bottom out for gas. But since Congress has, has approved the um, 2% um, payroll tax reduction, gas is going up 20% on an average. So now gas is $2.40 a week more. So you take that $2.40 off, now you're down to $11. Oil is going up. Some of the other things are going up. So when we got the payroll cut the year prior, other things went up and it was basically kind of a wash for us. And again, if this continues, we think we may be getting $13, the average person get $13.60, but as other commodities go up, you end up getting a lot less than we thought. And so that's why in, around the United States, we have more and more frustrated people. They're, they're frustrated, they feel that the politicians are being dishonest. And so that's a little fact check of the day. And again, you got to look into these numbers. You got to ask the politicians the questions, or they're just going to snow right right over us. <clears throat> and so, I was going through changing the, the subject to Newsweek magazine. It's a double issue, and it was for January 9th and 16th, 2002. One of the um, major articles in it is Inside Obama's Campaign. And everyone will admit that last year, two, three years ago, Mr. Obama ran a campaign for the textbooks. They raised money like no one else. They ran a campaign that people would, would, you would you, they're going to study for years um, forward. But as I went through the article, there was something that um, was really, really disconcerting to me. <clears throat> I, as an individual, I like to travel. I like my, my freedom. And, you know, I don't, I don't dress up all the time. I may put jeans on. I may be short, sneakers, and, and just walk about. I don't have to dress to impress. I want to have my freedom. I don't want to be trapped in, in a position. And a lot of Americans are like that. I think one of the greatest freedoms that Americans have compared to other places in the world is our ability to just get up. We can go to our boss and say, you know what, boss, I no longer want to work here. I no longer want to live in Keene. I'm moving out to Montana. I'm moving out to Idaho. You know what, I'm going to Arizona. And we can do that. You know, all you do is really make sure you take care of your, your responsibilities, but you can do it. But this is what got me. Messina has already hired an in-house design crew, an in-house gear team, and an in-house tech developers. They are tinkering away with a top secret application that will track every conversation that every single Obama volunteer has, every door they knock on, every action they take. This is what we will look like towards the end. This is what we look like towards the end of the 2008 primary season. Just, just look at it. <clears throat> Top secret application that will track every conversation that every single Obama employee he has. Okay. Why would I want to volunteer for someone if they're going to track every single conversation? Where is those conversations going to go that they track? The... Um, Goes, our effect on the ground and on the technology promised me will make 2008 prehistoric. A team of more than a dozen developers sat on big bouncy yoga balls, tapping away on their custom black keyboards they brought from home. Nevertheless, the developers were very much welcomed at one presidential plaza. For months now, prudent plaza, for months now, they have been figuring on how to re rewrite the campaign's code created when the iPhone was a novelty, when Twitter barely existed, and when Facebook was one-tenth in its current size. For this year's digital landscape, they are coming to some interesting conclusions. <clears throat> it, 
and it was, <clears throat> I'm just looking at it and I'm going, wait a minute, wait a minute. It says, instead, by logging in with their Facebook ID, volunteers get immediate access to any tools they can get in a field office. The cam campaign, meanwhile, gets immediate access to your Facebook network. Plus, whatever information you choose to enter about voters, you evidently contact. Just think, you're a volunteer. You open your Facebook and you go into the Obama campaign and the campaign gets immediate access to your Facebook network. Now, just think, you have 100, you have 200, you have 300 friends. As soon as you go into the Obama <clears throat> Network, you now have oh, given the Obama network campaign people access to every single one of the, your friends. I think some of your friends are not going to be happy because what happens to that ability to access your account? Does it go for on forever? Does the campaign sell it to s some other person running in 2012? <clears throat> You can say, call your friend, <clears throat> call your friend of a friend who is a lot more likely to persuade if you talk to them, and if it's an anonymous volunteer, that was a call instead. Last November, the campaign redesigned its website so that it would look and work on the, on the same on every platform, PC, mobile, tablet. Motivation was, wasn't purely um, for good looks. A site that renders properly on a smartphone makes it easier for volunteers to register new voters and call undecided voters on the go, and that kind of efficiently trans translates into extra votes. Now, just think. <clears throat> it used to be just your phone. Just realize how aggravating we have over been during this presidential um, camp, um, primary Calls and calls and calls. I'm Herman Cain. I want you to talk to you about my 999 program. I'm Newt Gingrich. I'm Centaurian. I'm Romney. Okay. Now, what's possibly coming up, you, you leave your house. If you have your iPad, you have your, <clears throat> your, your phone, you have anything, they will be able to reach out and contact you any time they choose. And um, I go, wait a minute, there was one uh, where they were going talking about it. They were talking basically how it's important. They're talking about the information, about harvesting the information. And it's kind of like, wait a minute, the American people in 2000, I think it was 2005 or 2006, with Admiral Poindexter, when President Bush <clears throat> had the government, Homeland Security, working with Admiral Poindexter as a private company, and for the people who can't remember Admiral Poindexter, uh, Admiral Poindexter and Lieutenant Colonel Olive North, they were the ones that were involved in the Iran Gate selling missiles, to make from buying missiles and selling them. I think it was Israeli missiles, selling them to Iran for cash to go in to support the, um, the Contras in um, Nicaragua in the, the 1980s when we as, the, as a country made it a, against the law to support the, um, the Contras. So that was how the crew, we were saying is, wait a minute, why should the government have the ability to harvest our, our phone calls, to harvest our credit card information, a harvest where we want to fly, harvest where we, we go. We said our freedom is really too important. Now, I'm not talking about President Obama because if President Obama's campaign can do this now, every campaign in the future will do it. To me, it's Orwellian, it's 1984, and if I want to vote for somebody, <clears throat> okay, I don't want that person knowing my mind. I don't want that person talking, knowing what I talk to my friends about. And um, I can't find it. I put it right here. But basically, 
what they want to do with the new program is basically look through your information. Everything that you put online, if you talk on, on Facebook or you put a blog, they will go in with the, the information, looking for that information, harvesting that information, and then <clears throat> using social sciences, marketers, people understand demographics, and what they're going to do is form a campaign to you specifically, basically to make us decide to vote for the candidate. To, you know, it's almost kind of like making us dummies. And so, like I said, it's not about Obama, it's not about this. To me, I think it's going to cost us our freedoms. Homeland Security costs us a lot of freedom. Patriot. Patriot costs us a lot of freedoms. I don't want a campaign person run to cost me my freedoms. I don't want them in my email. I don't want them in my Facebook account. I don't want them anywhere. It's for me to go out and contact them. It is for me to express my ideas, not for them to get into my head to tell me what to think. And so <clears throat> I would recommend for anybody, if they can Newsweek go to the public library and um, get the whole article. Um, or I think you can go on newsweek.com and download the, um, the article. So that, this is one of the things, few things that irritate me and so I just thought it was in, important to bring it up and to get your people thinking. And so my nose is getting a little stuffy, I gotta go get a little drink. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take another little short, about two and a half minute break, and then I'll come back and um, I'll close it up on some New Hampshire issues. Welcome back, and so what we're going to talk about for about the next six, seven minutes is <clears throat> some of the um, shenanigans that are going on in the, um, the State House. One of the things that was 
that was passed, the governor's veto was overridden, could have a serious um, cost effect on a, a local school, school budget. <clears throat> Basically, right now, any parent can come in and say, I object to this type, this cost. I don't like the way you're teaching it, or not the way you're teaching it, but I don't like the cost material. And so what I want you to do is develop a cost <clears throat> develop a curriculum that fits the state's requirement for my child to pass, but basically make it individual. So if you have 10, 12, 13 um, families come up to that, um, or basic, you can then basically have the equivalent of the school, the school district creating courses for people at the school district expense to um, to teach kids at home school because they can say you know what <clears throat> I don't believe in evolution so you got to create a science course science and biology course for me you talk about um, mathematics you and other science stuff you can say wait a minute some of those people were who are teaching uh, math the who came up with these theories you know what they were her heresies they didn't believe in God, so I don't want them teaching. I don't want them messing with my kids. So come up with a plan that, do, that does not include those. <clears throat> That's really <clears throat> a dangerous thing. Second one is, you know what? Everyone should have the right to have a gun on campus. And so, you know, in Keene, uh, a few years ago, we uh, I think on Willow Street, we had a student killing another student. Um, in, all, in Keene, we all know that we have some really heavy drinkers. And the question is, is it the right thing to go to a frat party, people drinking, and people can legally carry a concealed weapon? I don't think that's very smart. The Speaker O'Brien said, such individuals should not be voting in New Hampshire because they're immature and they really can't think very well. So if an 18-year-old is too immature to vote, why would it be all right for an 18-year-old to carry a concealed weapon to a frat party? Well, you can argue, well, you know what? It's underage. They don't drink. Well, let's look in Keene and see how many underage people um, get busted for, for drinking. The next big thing that, that's coming up that Speaker O'Brien stated that um, he wasn't going to touch until after the primary because he didn't want to put pressure on presidential candidates in New Hampshire to discuss the issue is marriage equality. It may be coming up on this Wednesday the 11th or maybe may be coming up on the 18th. Really don't know. <clears throat> he may play games with it with the, like he did with the right to work. <clears throat> I'm talking marriage equality. New Hampshire passed a, a marriage equality law where you have civil marriages, you have religious marriages. The government doesn't force any religion to marry people. And so basically you can go get married in civil or you can get married in a church and they both carry the same. And it was one of these, I don't view it as a, as a play on words. I never voted for, for gay marriage. I've never supported gay marriage, but I'm extremely active for um, marriage equality. And people go, well, marriage equality is the same thing as gay marriage. I would go, I differ with that, because why do you make the assumption, why would any of us have to make the assumption if people of the same sex get married, they either have to be lesbian or they have to be gay or maybe they're bisexual. Well, bisexual people get married all the time, okay? And I'm going gay, <clears throat> and I go, wait a minute. What happens if my best friend is sick with a very serious illness and I have great health care? Under marriage equality in New Hampshire, I can go and marry my best friend and give him help, my help, put him on my health care plan and help save his life. And 
I'm not gay, he's not gay, but why do we have to go and say, oh, they're gay because it's a same-sex marriage. If you have two single women, <clears throat> single mothers, and one has um, health care or other benefits, and they go, we can't afford to live together, but we want to have the benefits, and so they get married. Why do you have to assume right off the bat they're lesbians? I supported marriage equality. I'm writing my speech to, again, against go um, defend marriage equality because I don't think the government should be involved in, in sexual orientation. And what I do quite differently from other people, I do research and research. And right now, this book, oh, getting back is all the research that I've been doing uh, on same-sex marriage from the history going back for thousands of years. And I've got two other books this size. I want to do my homework. I want to step up and I want to be able to defend something <clears throat> without emotion based on facts. As I've gone through, we've had same-sex marriages going back <clears throat> for thousands of years. And we've also had same-sex marriages that had nothing to do with sexual relations. There's people who've had same-sex marriage for all kinds of reasons. In the Civil War, over 400 women dressed as men to fight and defend this country. History books go, it happened in the in Revolutionary War. Some of these women dressed as men, died as men, other ones lived as men, and they married other women. In, in the 1920s, in Harlem, New York, basically <clears throat> gay men and lesbians got married, and what they did is they used false names, or they feminized or masculine their name, or they had other people stand in, and they got married. And you know what? The, the state of New York never did anything against them. They never tried to dissolve those marriages. As you go around the country, in the history, there's been numerous same-sex marriages, and it hasn't destroyed us. It hasn't destroyed our, our culture. And again, it's marriage equality, and people, both heterosexuals, get married for all kinds of reasons. In a lot of cases, some of the reasons have nothing to, to do with sex. We in America, we write it. We, everyone deserves to be treated the same. So again, that's the big issue. Um, Again, they'll have a issue, um, a big, um, what do you call it, a big event on the Commons on Tuesday. So I'll be there. I'll be filming. I'll show it later. And so, again, thank you. And um, I'll see you on the long road. And maybe I would have seen some of you at the Common. And again, tell me your stories and help me defend um, marriage equality in the State House.